จะได้พบกับหัวข้อ DLP Framework นะคะหัวข้อนี้จะเป็นอย่างไรนะคะในโอกาสนี้ค่ะดิฉันขออนุญาตเรียนเชิญวิทยากรของเราค่ะ So I would like to invite Mr. Ray Markin Principal Consultant Professional Services Trellix to be on the stage Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Ray Markin. I'm from Australia, if you don't pick up on my accent. Uh, I've worked for Trellix as a professional service consultant, uh, specializing in DLP for the last 12 years or so. Before Trellix, obviously, we uh, had the, um, we were McAfee, and before that, we were Intel Security, and I've been working with DLP throughout those years as we've gone through the process. So I'm not going to talk so much today about the technology, because the technology is proven um, for DLP over the many, many years. But what I'm going to talk about more is how DLP can be successful as a program, not so much as a technology, and I'll explain more as we go through. Of course, I'm not going to talk about technology, so this is the only slide about technology. Um, this is our new Trellix uh, platform. We have the one console on top. We have five um, core engines, and we've put a focus today on the data protection. So we've got endpoint security, email, network security, cloud. And if you'd like more information about the actual technology, please speak to the colleagues um, at the booth. But again, I'm going to shy away from that because this isn't the point of the presentation. The presentation today is all about data loss prevention being a program, not just a product. So why should we have a DLP program or a data loss protection program? What we often find over the years is I see a common theme happening. And we often get called into customers who have taken DLP, they've purchased it, whether it's ours or whether it's somebody else, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but they have treated it as a reaction. So for an example, they might need to meet some sort of compliance uh, or they have a risk audit um, happen. So they get DLP because the audit comes back and says, you need DLP. So they buy DLP as a product, they install it, they tick a few boxes of the out-of-the-box policies and, and that's about it, they don't really focus. And then we get called in later on and say, hey, something's happened. So for an example, we went with a customer. Uh, we got called in because they had, a, they had a DLP product and they had a data breach. And they called in, and it was bigger than DLP. This was a big cybersecurity breach. And they, they wanted to step back and try and review what's happening with our data security. The CISO had to report up to the board um, about what DLP was doing. So they said, hey, what are we doing wrong? So we identified very early, actually, that um, only, they deployed DLP across their email. Uh, and they only had two rules. They had a part-time resource who was triaging the information uh, from the SOC team and wasn't really interested and didn't know what to do, actually, when, when something um, was um, flagged as an incident. So we saw very quickly there was gaps in visibility of the data and an inability to actually respond accordingly because they hadn't really given it much thought. They installed the product a bit like an antivirus. They installed it and thought it would just update and all their DLP problems would be solved. But that's not quite the case. Uh, so the CISO said, can you put together a plan for us, please? Help us um, uh, do this better. What, what are we doing wrong? We have a product, and that's true. Um, so we, we put together a steering committee, and we invited some stakeholders. We identified some stakeholders uh, who had some data owners that they produced, and we, they, we would speak to them quite regularly to understand more of a business context. Because this thing, DLP is more of a business uh, tool. It's not so much an IT, an IT tool. And this is something which I see that paradigm shift often with customers, which is nice when they get that shift. We see now you're going to get good use out of, out of DLP. Uh, so then we spoke with the, um, the business owners, and we understood what really matters to them, fed that back to uh, the IT guys, set up policies in place, and um, got them underway. Then they were happy. We got um, good results from them. So they, later on, they said, OK, we're not so scared now to turn on more DLP rules because it's all working properly. So we matured it, et cetera. But I'll go through some examples and so forth throughout this presentation. So that's why uh, put, thinking about DLP as a program is important, not just the technology. Um, but we want to see some of the benefits. And obviously, protecting sensitive information is key. I mean, that's what we buy DLP for in the first place, right? Uh, but we, what's more important is that we align this with business people, processes, and technology. So for an example, we had a customer who one time put in DLP policies for rude words because they thought that feels like we should monitor people doing rude words. We don't want that in their organization. But that didn't actually matter in the end. It was a waste of resources and a waste of value because um, what would happen is the SOC team would read it, 
DLP would flag all these rude words, I'd have a bit of a giggle, and, um, but they couldn't do anything with it. It wasn't actually breaking company policy. So we need to have that alignment. Does this matter? How valuable is it? And it needs to be built in as part of a framework, part of a, part of a um, program. Uh, also, a good DLP program is aligned, it's, it's tailored, and I'll show examples of this across different organisations. Um, it provides governance, assurance and auditability, so we can see it's not just a product. This is something which a framework around it is what makes it valuable. Uh, and again, not just Trollix, this is any, so I'm appealing to anybody who's had DLP, this is the sort of stuff you want to start thinking about. I'm trying to share some insights that I've had over the years uh, that will make something successful or not so successful. Uh, the data loss prevention program wants to identify risks and broken unsanctioned processes. So one of the added values that you can get from DLP, one of the added values you can get from DLP, thank you, is um, to be able to identify things that uh, ordinarily would be happening and you don't even realise they're happening. Without a program around this, SOC analysts don't pick this stuff out. They don't see uh, that this can add value to your company. Uh, it will heighten security awareness in terms of um, communications back to end users and it will strengthen adapt over time. So it's like a living, breathing organism when you put it in around as a program. So I mentioned before that it's customised and tailored to your organisation. We'll see some examples of why. I'll briefly go through these. I won't spend much time because I know we're reducing time to try and get through. So um, if we look at government, try and see this in the lens that it's the same product. You've got DLP in, um, installed. Uh, but all of these will treat it differently. So government would usually look after egress, you know, data loss and ingress. So, for example, you wouldn't want a top secret document to go into a secret or an unclassified environment because the cost is huge, the risk is huge if this happens. So they look at um, data going across the network. Uh, they're also interested in sort of protected markings and classifications and, and so forth, whereas banking is more interested in ensuring their indicators of financial compromise uh, are flagged and they, they maintain their reputation as a trusted, trusted, secure bank. Medical has lots of PIIs, so the um, Personal Data Protection Act applies to them. However, the Personal Data Protection Act applies to the insurance companies as well, but the data will look different. It's very different between, between customers. Retail are full of regulations, PCI compliance, GDPR, um, et cetera, et cetera. All these things matter. They're all compliance pieces. However, one retail outlook would look different to a different retail outlook. Uh, so the data looks different. The policies should be different to get good value. Private industry, as a last example, might just be source code. And for a bank or government, well, not so important. But for these guys, it's important. Same DLP product, but used differently. And uh, in order to maximise the data protection, we have to step back and look at it. So don't just say, we've installed it. Uh, you want this to give back, and it is, it's a business tool. It gives back to the business when the business invests in it. So we have the, the initial investment of the purchase of the tool, but you want to invest with putting a framework around it. So what do we mean by a framework? The framework, first of all, we have to look at um, governance and compliance, risk and assurance, and then the operational processes, escalations, etc. And I'll talk more about this as we go through. Uh, we want to identify the proper stakeholders, who's, who's important uh, as far as who wants to know about this data, who needs to get reported to it, who are the data owners, who are close to it, who can we interview along the way. And even the producers, the consumers, the SOC analysts need to understand that this has all been put together for them and formalised so that when they find something, when they see a breach, they know exactly what to do and they know it's been endorsed by the business. They're not afraid to actually escalate it. So to start with this thing, well, after identifying the, we, we get the governance model in place. Uh, we ensure we know who the stakeholders are and, and their role in the data loss protection program. We start to understand what's their high value data. So one thing we find quite often when we go to customers is that the first thing they focus on is whatever the immediate thing is. If it's a PCI compliance, we need to look after credit cards. If it's some sort of audit risk, we have to do whatever they do. But then they step back and they can either say, right, yeah, we're done, or they can then go, okay, what else is valuable? And you'll be surprised the amount of valuable data that we can pick up on through interviews. So we typically interview the data owners and other stakeholders, uh, maybe do a discovery piece or like a technical discovery piece, look at some repositories, look at some applications that uh, may can have sensitive, inherently sensitive data in them and uh, flag those so that anything that comes out of them can be tracked across the organisation and as it egresses. 
Uh, and one of the other parts of a program is it's a formalised way of reviewing requirements. So one thing I see often is without a program, DLP gets installed, somebody looks after the policies, and then business comes up to them and says, hey, I want something that protects this particular item. And the psych analyst or the, the person who does the um, policy work says, OK, I'll do that. And they put it in, and it flags, but no one cares in the end. So we have to ask, hang on, that was a requirement, I understand, but uh, how do we know that it's very valuable? So for example, if they say, I want to protect confidential information, so look for the word confidential. I've seen this all the time. So they, pro they put DLP in place, they look for the word confidential, and they get all sorts of stuff come through. They get things saying, hey, if this was confidential, blah, 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 it doesn't really matter, it's not confidential. Uh, so how do you get rid of the noise? How do you make sure that the requirement's met? And that's through good use of good use cases. And we help typically go through use cases. We see suboptimal configurations all the time. This is a, this is a real pitfall, and it doesn't have to be. Um, too many incidents lowers confidence in the product. It, um, it lets the adds more risk because those who are triaging this stuff um, can't really tell what's what's real and what's not real, and the whole value goes away. Great product, uh, but just not being used properly. So, good DLP policy is an art and a science. It has to be accurate, that's for sure. It has to meet the compliance, of course. That's what it's there for. But one thing that's often overlooked is minimising business disruption. So. Um, on one hand, uh, some customers will be too shy. They don't want to turn something into like automatically block on their behalf. Now, that's a great technical tool. It's a really good for the business to have your tool recognise important stuff and block it sensitive. But they'll be too shy because they think if we do this, it's going to be disruptive to the business. Um, but it doesn't have to be, not if you design it accurately. Uh, and on the other hand, some will say, just block it. This is too important. And then they have a bad day in the office because it does actually cause a lot of business disruption. Uh, it's data-driven and it's based on uh, DLP best practices. So to help with this, as part of this framework, as part of the program, we put together like a five-stage um, phase program. And first stage, obviously, is just planning with the SMEs, doing that interview that we talked about earlier. Then we define the rules, we put them into place, we put them into monitor mode and let, let things happen over time. And we can see the sort of data that comes through and we can analyse and we do spreadsheets and, and work out some analytics around that. Then we bring it back to the business because that's the important part here, the business. It's not an IT tool. Um, the business will then say, hey, look, we present to them and say, this one particular sender of email does 60% of this stuff. Uh, is it really bad? Is it important? Is it, is it uh, actually sanctioned? And we work with them, they say, no, that's fine. So we, we exclude those, and then we look at the remaining 40%, and we see that 30% of that is some other data. And we, we do this little iterative thing, until eventually we say, right, yeah, this is good. We now can see, we can forecast, that if we turn on blocking tomorrow, there'll be no business disruption, and we're going to add a lot of value. Then we, uh, we potentially do encryption, we do blocking, and Afterwards, a year later, a quarter later, whatever it is, we review back and say, is this still doing what we wanted to do from back then? Uh, and that goes on. So we have the technology taken care of, we have the uh, people taken care of, we have the compliance, and we have good DLP policy. The last thing, or second last thing actually, is making sure that the workflows are formalised. How do the incident triage team know that they can escalate when they see a particular thing? Or how do they raise it to be a process improvement when they realise it's a broken process, etc.? And how do we approve properly um, only valuable uh, DLP policies? And lastly, the um, governance and compliance and assurance, auditability. So we had a customer one time who had DLP. They hadn't actually created a program yet. Um, and he said to me, hey, Ray, he was a curious sort of guy. Uh, he was in charge of writing the policies, and he said, "How would I? Can this tool be designed to maybe look at spreadsheets or PDFs or anything, any sort of document that might have, you know, pay information? Because he wanted a promotion, and he was curious on what his colleagues were getting to paid, right? Now, this is the thing: the tool does it. The tool can be configured to do just about anything. But the question is, how do we do this properly? How do we make sure? How do, how do we police the police? This is a powerful tool. How do we know that it's being used for the right purposes? So you have to have a framework to ensure that you, the, all this is incorporated into part of a DLP framework. Now, there are examples. I, I believe we're running a little bit short on time, so I'll flip through them very quickly. But these are some real-world examples um, that have happened out in the field. So this was a data discovery. This is the idea. If you look at this with the lens of not having a program versus having a program, uh, the, this was a 
somebody who had a program and they were like midway through, they were like medium maturity model. Uh, and this, they were just putting in the DLP Discover, they had network DLP and they have an endpoint DLP and they said, okay, we're good now, let's do discovery as well. So they come to me and said, hey, we want to do a discovery of, of payment card industry, some, some credit cards. So they wanted to point towards a particular database and I said, is this, um, what is this database? And they said, well, it's a payment database. So I said, how many, how many records do you know might be in this? And they said, oh, about six and a half million. I said, okay, so... Uh, I'm going to assume this has a lot of credit cards in it. And they said, yeah, there'll be six and a half million. So I said, well, that's not so much a discovery, right, because we know this. Uh, but this is the point of the program, is that it questions the requirement and breaks it down into use cases. So we said, well, I understand the requirement. You want to find credit cards. So let's look at it differently. So we, we identified a different database, and we looked at one of those databases that has um, operations records, you know, where customers phone in and the, the call centre Types. Now, they're not allowed to put in credit cards. But I said, let's point at this one and see how we go. That had millions of records as well. We scanned it, and sure enough, there was thousands of credit card records. So this was valuable now, right? The same tool, but the process allows us to then question, break it down to use cases and get value out of it. Um, as a result of that, they were able to, if they had a PCI audit, they'd be in trouble. But we got there before that, which is good. This is what helps. And um, they were able to clean up all those credit cards and put a web interface to stop it from happening when they enter into the web interface from that point forward. Uh, as a result of the program, we have um, a critical audit risk treatment that was done there. This is quite good. This is a global organisation that I worked with. They were very mature in their DLP program. Uh, and they've been, there's a particular primary identifier that needed to be blocked through regulation. And it had executive visibility, and it was a big deal for them. And they were trying not to do this uh, because they were too afraid. But actually with the program, we went through and did the analytics and realised we could do a layered approach so we could block accurately, and we blocked 100% accuracy. Uh, and the executive went down the hallway and rang a bell. That was the process they had. It was quite, quite nice. So in the interest in uh, wrapping it up, I won't go through the last one. I just want to show you this last picture, which is basically the program map. So this is what a mature DLP program should look like. Um, and we notice that a lot of companies start with the technology. They start underway with that. That's great. They normally have a little bit of incident response. But all of these boxes, in terms of what should be a mature DLP program, nothing to do with the technology. A little bit to do with the technology, but, but hardly. Most of it is around the program and the framework we put around it. So hopefully I've provided a little bit of information about um, if you have got a DLP solution at the moment, if you're looking at getting one, just a little bit of insight from the field on, on how to use this thing in a way that can be very meaningful and very successful and give back to the business and continue to grow and develop and become better and better over time so you maximise your investment. Um, thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. I love Bangkok. I'm going to come back. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Ray Markin, Principal Consultant, Professional Services from Twelex. And in this level, I need to ask you to ask you, Mr. Nakhapol, to ask you 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 to ask you. ค่ะต้องขอขอบคุณทุกท่านเป็นอย่างสูงด้วยนะคะ